welcome to The Art of Life. I'm your host, Willow Chang Alion. We broadcast live every Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. here in the heart of Honolulu in downtown. I am beyond thrilled to introduce our guest today. She is a woman who is dear to my heart and has returned to Hawaii to come share the artistry and the magnificence of her dancing, among other things, my Oriti dance guru, Miss Jyoti Rao. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Lilo. We are so glad to Namaste, have everybody. Aloha. Hello. I'm very, very excited to be here among you all. Viewers. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to spend this time right now with all of you. Um, some positive message, some positivity together. And uh, yes. Absolutely. Now, Jyoti has devoted her life. It is her calling. Uh, not only to the arts, but also uh, the sacred practices of India, um, communication, and transference of those things. But what I'd like is if we could get them to know a little bit about you. So I always ask our guests to give us their origin stories, how they came to be, how they discovered their passion, and you know why it's important to you. Well, from a childhood, uh, only thing I am attracted and I want to do and I am doing is dance. And this dance is uh, from uh, the temple uh, of Orissa, Jagannath Temple. And um, from uh, very childhood, it was kindled in my heart uh, watching the tribal people dancing and uh, under the full moon. And um, the culture like Hawaii has and culture like ancient cultures, uh, they always, uh, you know, uh, tell me that how they are grounded to the earth and wind and nature, ocean. So where I grew up, it was surrounded by hills. And um, dance is something that didn't come from outside. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I was born with the passion of dance. And till now, very this moment, I am very passionate about dance. It's so evident. It's evident in everything that you do. So I'd like perhaps... There are five or eight, depending on who's doing the definitions, of uh, various forms of classical Indian dance. So we want to assert that Odissi is a classical form um, with, a, with a legacy, with theory, with a structure, um, with a continuum of, of gurus and practitioners. And it is a very, it's different. I mean, there are elements within various Indian dance forms, and I'm by no means an expert. I just want to be clear about that. I am. I have passion and I'm still a student, forever a student. But there are things that are uh, similar, familiar, narrative dance forms, as well as uh, musical or rhythmic interpretations. The hastas or the mudras, the hand gestures, clearly Vedic texts and stories, these would be um, shared uh, similarities. But stylistically, and, and the music and uh, the songs of Odissi are very unique and specific. Um, can you give us some hallmarks of that? I'd rather hear it from you <laughs> than from me. You know, uh, we know the way you are uh, saying um, all these things. Uh, you are very educated about it. I try. <laughs> because, um, see, um, this classical dance uh, has a thousands of years of background, the history. It comes from the ancient temples uh, in the carving of the temples, the deities and uh, around the temple and also in the scriptures and uh, the classical dance and music and rhythm, they come from Gnatya Shastra, which is the ancient uh, scriptures. And all the hastas have meanings. We use hasta mudras in uh, doing the prayers, doing the rituals, as well communicating with the nature, communicating with uh, among people, among other animals and birds, like that, or uh, living beings. So hastas are something uh, like very original thing which has been used um, with the creation from the beginning. And uh, it comes from Natya Shastra. The main text, uh, textbooks about it uh, is Natya uh, Abhinaya Darpana, Abhinaya Shastra, and uh, uh, Abhinaya Chandrika. A lot of texts are there. There are a lot of uh, single hand mudras, Pataka, Tripataka, Ardha Pataka, Kartari Mukha, Mayura, Ardha Chandra. Arala, Sukatunda, Musti, Sikhara, Kapitha, Kataka Mukha, Kataka Mukha, Kataka Mukha, Suchi, just keep going. <laughs> then there are double hand mudras. Um, Anjali, Kapota, Karkata, Swastika, Dola, Hasta, Puspa, Puta, Ustanga, it keeps going. 
there are eye movements, there are neck movements, there is head movements, there is the body postures and uh, how to hold body straight or a little bit bent or more bent. We will be learning more uh, this afternoon in the workshop. But uh, to tell you, share uh, with all of you about this uh, classical art form is, uh, it's uh, really, if somebody wants to learn, it is a hand down from guru to disciple. Somebody really wants to know because it's a path of a spirituality. Spirituality is a path of finding self. It's a path of finding God. So for that, you have to be 100% committed. And uh, uh, sadhana, the practice, has to be done in a very disciplined way. The lifestyle has to be very disciplined way. The mind has to be tamed, trained. So it's the lifestyle. So it's a very um, yogic, very spiritual uh, bond uh, practice. And uh, how it was done in the ancient time is that we go to Gurukula, where the teacher lives. We serve Guru. And by serving, we know how a person, being a drummer, being a dancer, how a dancer lives, how a dancer thinks, how a dancer eats, how a dancer deals with the time of sorrow, time of turmoil, time of joy, time of romance, how a dancer, how a dancer is, right? So for that, you have to be close to your teacher, your guru. And if something is bubbling in your mind, you can always interrupt me. Feel free. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> because I will keep going. So it's like that. So you serve Guru and then you get the knowledge. If you don't win the heart of Guru, getting the knowledge is impossible. You can get the information. Information, you can get it with a teacher. You can get it from book. You can get it from Google these days has all the information in the world. You can get it with Google Guru. But to get the knowledge, you absolutely need a teacher. It's uh, the embodiment of that, or yes. the integration. And I yes. think you, uh, you mentioned something which is so important, because we are in perhaps maybe a renaissance, a rebirth, or a renewed interest of learning, or at least access to information. I, I can't imagine a time when there have been access to so many different things. Uh, whether that's classical Indian dance or Tibetan Book of the Dead or you want to see translations of songs. I mean, there's so much information out there. But information is not animated, I think, without a teacher. There's beauty and self-learning and intellectual curiosity and, and wonderment and awe. Those are very important things that help uh, that process, that learning process. But it's a teacher, it's a guru who helps bring in the life they breathe life into uh, the lesson. And so much of that is about listening. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just, I was listening to the radio on my drive, and uh, the DJ had mentioned something saying, oh, I have a hard time understanding accents, and I think it's because I don't listen enough, even though they like music. And to me, they seemed so compatible, because accents and cadences and phrases of, of language are its own type of music. But I thought it was very astute that this DJ had talked about listening. And I think that when you have a chance to study with your teacher, uh, it's that opportunity to listen to what they say. And there's also wisdom in what is not said. Yeah. Uh, there's a discernment. A teacher decides mm -hmm. what it is that they want to say, when they want to say it, and mm -hmm. how they mm -hmm. say it. Yes. It depends on the disciple that when a disciple is ready to hear what, and when a disciple ready to do something, mm -hmm. when is disciple ready to carry out some action? Because without the right time, if something, something is said, it's not going to manifest. Like when there is a weather is right and you plant a seed, mm -hmm. you will have a bulb comes out when a season right. gives flower. But if you plant in a wrong season, the bulb, no matter how much care you give, is not going to give you flower. Because it's not time, it's not season. Right. So its own season it blooms. So a real guru, a teacher is very much in tune with when which disciple needs what. Because I have over 100 students. Mm -hmm. And every individual, every student is very different than each other. Yeah. They have very different way of receiving. I need to be tuned in how to teach that the person will receive the best. Mm -hmm. And it varies. The same teaching, this person receives 100%. Same teaching if I, if I give somebody else will not receive at all. 
So I have to be alert and seeing who is in front of me and what we, I am doing teaching right this minute. And through the art or anything deeper spiritual based practice, you don't get full benefit or you don't uh, know 100% of it unless you are living it, unless it manifests through your character, through your being. You have to become one. Right. Otherwise, it's knowledge. You can be so much have knowledge and you can talk about it, write books about it. I have met a lot of scholars and in seminars they will say, well, this dance, this, 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 this dance. I said, no. If we choka is one foot uh, away from each other, mm -hmm. no, it doesn't go with everybody because some people have longer legs, some people have shorter legs, longer body, some people have longer legs, shorter body. When the scriptures was written, it was written only for Oriya people who lived in Odisha, a typical body. That typical body has changed also because the food habit has changed. Right. And now we have international everything melting pot, they get cheese, they get all kinds of broccoli in Odisha, which was like never heard of. Oh my goodness. So people think differently, people grow differently. So how can we will have, so people who are teaching, they know that which body should do what. I want everyone to think about that. Okay. We have a little bit of a break. It gives you a chance to think about how has your life changed with different influences that might be considered internal, external, can I say that, or other. We'll be right back. This is The Art of Life. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia In Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to the environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Alalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And Ar on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. And we are back. This is the Art of Life. I am very grateful to have uh, guru and dance instructor Jyoti Rao here visiting us from California, but originally and still goes back and forth to India every two months. My goodness, they must know you at TSA. <laughs> she just takes off her shoes. So Jyoti, before we went to break, you had mentioned something that I thought was really interesting, and that is you had said that scholars approach dance in a different way than practitioners because it's using the mind as maybe opposed to integrating the whole body and living the dance on a daily basis as a guru like yourself does. You had also mentioned that there are adaptations that need to be made depending on the physiology or the body of the dancer or the practitioner. So the one size fits all which might have worked thousands of years ago before there was an inner uh, exchange of ideas and diet and cultures and even ethnicities and races and what have you, these things have to adapt. And I thought that was so interesting because um, dance is a living art form, right? And it changes and it evolves. I was wondering, uh, Indian dance was affected by the anti-notch movement, so this is when Oh, the lovely British came into India and set up shop, colonialism, all of those joys that it brings. I am being facetious. And a cultural misunderstanding of the Devadasi, the temple dancer practice, led this belief that dancing was a horrible, illicit activity and that girls of good virtue should not be dancers and all of those things. And surprisingly, from the accounts I've read, I obviously was not around then, <clears throat> pardon me, dance kind of went underground and, and it, it, was, uh, it was threatened by this anti-notch movement. And there has been since, thankfully, in the 20th century, a renaissance and a renewed cultural interest and pride and uh, protectionary measures taken to bring dance to the esteemed position it should have. You're like, where is the question? My question is, how, uh, how was Odissi dance affected by the anti notch movement? Was it impacted by it in a small way, in a large way? And what is the role of dance in India today with Odissi? Well, um, 
with uh, Mughal ruling over India for a long time, mm -hmm. and British, Portuguese, it's like, um, like I said, the world is melting pot. Right. So with that history, um, that uh, North was affected the most, so that's where Kathak became court dance, it's blossom in the court. So any Bollywood dance, any commercial dance you see has a lot of influence of Kathak mm -hmm. movement, census eyes and census movement and all that, right? But uh, Bharatnatyam on the side, uh, south was not that much affected. So is Odissi because Odisha comes from uh, Odissi comes from Odisha, mm -hmm. which is easternmost state and is a very traditional place. Like you know, if somebody will come to Hawaii. They'll come to Honolulu, they will come to Big Island and, you know, Maui. Hawaii is a little place and it still has the essence of Hawaii, right? A lot. Because I used to go to Hawaii a lot. So, um, it's like that. Od Odisha is like that. Mm -hmm. So, it's still it is a very much traditional place. And Odish Odisha dance is still a devotional approach. We have to have an altar on the stage that we offer. Mm -hmm. The dance begins with the offering. Right. So, it's a, it begins with an invocation. Then it goes to the foundation, uh, which we call is Thainato. Then it goes to concentration, which is Pallavi. Then it goes to devotion, where we act out the stories and become one with the character. And when you become one with the character, moksha happened itself, liberation. You're liberated. So it ends with liberation. So it's still, Odyssey dance is a spiritual practice, and it's still it's uh, as pure as, you know, one dance form can be and not too much influenced. Right. Even though Katha came from also from the temples, it has the same background, it has the same roots as Odyssey as Bharatnatyam. All the, all the um, um, classical dance forms, they have same kind of background and uh, the same source, they all came from the same source. So, Considering that Odyssey didn't really go to the courts and, and really didn't go through, through the commercialism right. and, and affected by Mughals and all that. Yeah. Fascinating. Very, very interesting. You had mentioned in your response about these different um, parts that comprise a dance performance. And I wanted to address that because I don't expect people to be experts on classical Indian dance if it's not of their culture or their training um, or opera or any of these things because every discipline has uh, the foundation of what makes it or defines it as its art. That being said, it's troubling because I think when people ask or invite someone to be involved in a program, <laughs> and I know you do with this all the time, they'll say, okay, can you do a three-minute dance? Or yeah. Can you do a five-minute dance? What uh, what type of response or advice could you give artists um, in trying to explain and educate producers or event coordinators that um, they should maybe consider allotting a little more time or that if you truncate something or if you edit it, it, it diminishes some of the essence of the dance. I mean, your intention can be there, but if you want to do it justice, if you want to honor this tradition, it's not something that you can just edit down to two minutes. It How do you deal with this? <laughs> it is a very good question, Willow, because um, uh, probably you deal with this a lot because um, you are a um, multi-style dancer. So people might uh, expect that any like 30 second item you can do. Yeah. Because for Odissi, um, where I stand is they, when they invite an Odissi dancer, they are looking for something classical. Mm -hmm. And it's a process for the dancer, it's a process for the audience. To process through the devotion and concentration and devotion and liberation, it takes time to warm up. You can't be swimming in the middle of the ocean, deep water. How? Somebody will drop you or what? <laughs> you have to go to the beach and start swimming towards the deep blue water of Hawaiian Ocean. Right. So how you will explain that, that if they want to really have a dance, have a dance. Yeah. You know, if you want something 15 seconds, there is plenty of my photos. Yeah. Why don't you do a slide so? 
with a nice music playing on the background. But if you want a dancer to be performing, you have to respect that she's going to get ready and how many hours of the practice has gone through that movement, one movement to just do this. How much of muscles practice we did yeah. just to do this. How much of practice of the eye discipline we have done. And you want that in 15 seconds. Like they're saying, they want the pie, but they have 5 seconds, 10 seconds, just give us the pie. And it's so much in the West world, they want things now. Yes, that immediacy. Which brings me to my next question. In India, I'm going to make an assumption there, because shame on me, I haven't been there yet. You're going to come. I know. This God year. willing. <laughs> I'm going to make it happen. <laughs> Um, there's going to be time to wait. There's waiting. There's this whole thing called waiting mm -hmm. that happens outside of what we'll call the Western world, for lack of a better word. These are horrible generalizations. But that being said, there's something to be gained in that process. Um, of waiting? Of waiting. Uh, and patience is one of them. Reflection is another one. Uh, observation comes from waiting. All of these good things that actually are kind of the fruits from the process of waiting and being uh, patient and taking your time, whether you're choosing to or it's just the circumstances, finding ways to cope with that, that process of waiting. Do you think that people's attention spans have been compromised oh, yeah. because everything is so immediate? Yeah, Do you yeah. think that, do you find in this recent time, you've been in our country for 20 years now. Mm -hmm. Have you seen a change in attention spans, whether it's in the classroom or at a performance, or do you think that people still understand and respect that um, there needs to be time for these things to unfold? Well, definitely it has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. Like you see everything changing. Everything changing and it's the nature of existence changing. But sometimes, sometimes it changes for uh, positivity, good reasons. Sometimes it changes for uh, unproductive uh, productive things and bad reasons. And the nature takes care of it. And then there is tsunami. There is global warming. There is all kinds of unknown diseases and everything else. And then balances out. But anyway, uh, with me, um, yes, things are changing. People want everything immediately and now. People are much more impatient. People are much more wanting just a ready-made service. They don't want the process at all. They're not interested. But in my class, personally, in mm -hmm. my class, I'm very old school. I'm very old style. Because I think the Odyssey dance has survived thousands of years. It has some energy. It has some message. It has some, has a, some benefits. That's why it's surviving. Oh, I say Lord. the same thing to my students. Yeah. I say if it's been done for thousands of years, it has got something. That's something right. that yes. works. A <laughs> lot of things come and go, come and go and this. So if it's my responsibility as a dance guru, as a spiritual teacher, to deliver the way it is, if I don't deliver, deliver the way it is, then it's not Odyssey. So people who come to me, they already know that they're going to a authentic guru to learn. And if it needs, they have to sit there, that class, and not learn anything, be it. Right. One student who is like, she has like three, four, uh, you know, she has PhDs and master's degrees and everything. Very intellectual, very smart girl, very, very smart girl. So she was learning dance with me and her thing of how I was teaching her to, I ignored her for two, three years. Absolutely ignored her. She patiently waited. Everybody said, you know, if she's not paying attention, nothing, just leave. I don't know what it was in her, what she saw. She's born in America. She grew up here. She's very highly educated. She saw something. That's why she waited for three years. After three years, I started paying attention to her. I said, you have to let a teacher teach you, unless until you're not letting in, mm -hmm. not opening door. How will I teach you? If you are having expectation that you, uh, teacher should behave this way or teach this way, then it's your ideas. So why you need teacher? Right. You go to a teacher with no ideas. Let them guide you. Then you will reach the goal. After that, then I said, if you want me to teach you, make up your mind, come to my house. If I will tell you that just clean my toilet and go home, you are not going to ask me 
I didn't do any technical practice or any dance movements. I didn't learn anything. Jyotipa, what is, you know, you will not question. You will just come and do as you are instructed. If that kind of surrenderness you are ready to give, I can teach you. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ted Ralston. You know, Ted is the uh, host of uh, Where the Road Leads. It shows uh, every Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. It's about technology. It's about how people collaborate and, and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there, 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. That's fine. I was just caught in the act drinking out of my the Art of Life mug. Our producer Jay said, you sure like that logo, don't you? And I said, of course I did. Gave birth to it. You have to enjoy what you do, <laughs> just as I enjoy the company of Guru Jyoti Rao. And she has devoted her whole life to dance and the culture of India and the arts. You know, you were talking about students coming to the house, including the toilet, which some people might be shocked. But this is a very uh, a common practice to be in servitude to your guru, whether that's rubbing their feet or cleaning their house or doing what's necessary, that transmission of what is really some would call an energy exchange. Um, and another thing, when I was driving to the show today, I saw a bar. We have a, a local bar. I'm a non-drinker, it's true. But this bar changes hands every six months. This is something that happens frequently in Hawaii. They change owners and they change names. And the bar's new name is called Surrender. Uh -huh. And I was meditating on that, and I thought, that is a very, to me, a strange name for a bar because it can mean so many things. But f And then I started thinking, and I thought, but in your other uh, facets of life, surrendering, some people tend to think that that submission is that you're giving up and that you're weak and that you've, you're lesser, but there is actually strength in being able to surrender. I was thinking about that. The strength in being able to surrender, to allow the process to happen, to have faith that the process is what is right, as with timing, as you mentioned, um, to give yourself, to allow the other person to steer the vessel, whether that's your guru or a higher power. There's actually a lot of strength, because I think it shows that there's belief and there's hope. So surrendering doesn't have to have those connotations of something as weakness. And I think somehow in the Western society, aside from the, the Christian aspect of suffering, because suffering and surrendering are not the same, there's, a great, there's a great fear of surrender. Yeah, People, because they don't understand. Yeah it's, yeah, it's many more things. It's much more complex. Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. was our philosophical moment of the day, part three. We have some photos. I know that a few of them might have been... Uh, shown already, but we'd love for you to give us some narration to let our viewers know what these images are associated with. So, sure. Ooh, beautiful. You know, these photos are from um, Chosati Jogini, one temple, uh, 64 kinds of goddesses. One of the oldest temple in Bhubaneswar. Mm -hmm. I very much encourage you to go visit. We do have uh, trainings and programs in December. Uh, I hold it personally, and we have a big school, Jyoti Kala Mandir, which, which has its own uh, building where students live and learn. So it's like a Gurukula system where you live with the teacher and learn. It's not too far from this temple, and it has 64 kinds of goddesses with the 64 hair do, hair style, 64 kinds. Oh. All right, <laughs> something. Amazing. And they're Dakinis. They're yes. goddesses, Dakinis, mm -hmm. okay? So very powerful temple. Well, these are my students. And we did a photo shoot, I think, three years ago. And there is still dancing, all of them. A um, couple of students are in college, but they come back and dance in the summer. So we I have a... Your feet. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> they do. One is with me, Ananda Kali. Yeah. She's the champion. Yeah. I'm serving, massaging my feet. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they're wonderful. They're really wonderful. And uh, when they learn as a kid, they start, they become a full human being with uh, all the ethical qualities and they're happy, balanced, and confident in the world. Fantastic. They're not lost. And, here's and here. this one is um, Abhang Bhangi. I am looking at uh, through the shoulder and looking to 
uh, see Krishna or looking uh, for a moment of joy uh, to have the glimpse. So, and the headdress called Tahiya. This one is peeking through the mirror and um, peeking through the window and seeing beyond. The west band called Bengopatiya, which is around the west, is a very traditional jewelry from Orissa and it's made of uh, silver because silver is from Orissa and uh, the intricate uh, silver work called uh, filigree work right. and uh, we call it Taro Kosi. Taro is string, Kosi is when you made, uh, make patterns with the string, Taro Kosi. And uh, the head uh, uh, jewelry called Sinthi, which is on uh, the forehead with both side and middle. And, um, and the necklace and uh, you know, we call it Haro, if you want to know Odia word for it. So, um, and the Tahia is on the head. This one is the uh, older uh, part of the photo, also peeking through the little windows when it was made of sticks in the village because the house uh, before was made uh, with the mud, soil, like a lot of, lot of mud and just branches from the tree and the bamboo. And the windows were also crisscrossed with the small bamboos to air to flow. So this hand gesture is looking through that window which has the little holes in it. And some old villages still have that, still they have it in the small thing. And the pattern around my eyebrows called chitta and it's a very traditional makeup when we do around, uh, go around our eyebrows like that. In the weddings this happens and any any spiritual dance and something uh, auspicious, uh, we do it. And in some festival, just everybody does it, like girls, small girls, and everybody put chandan, the right. sandal paste. So it's a symbolic. This pose is about the Durga, that with the extreme, uh, like third eye opens, and uh, intensity and the fire burns forth from the third eye, where she surrenders to uh, Shiva, and Shiva and Shakti become one, Shiva and Goddess power of male and female become one, then only the unity happens and extreme uh, change takes place, th that unity. So this uh, expression is about that, that the, her eyes are open, her third eye open and she's looking up and the fire comes uh, forth. That's why I have a red uh, flower on the side because it's symbolic of goddess. This is deity from uh, Odisha, Jagannath. Is, uh, Jagannath is the form of uh, Krishna and um, the city Jagannath temple is called Puri in Odisha and this dance comes from the Jagannath temple and uh, the headdress on the back, the white thing you are seeing called Tahiya. That's how this Tahiya comes to our dance, our headdress comes from the deity. Tahiya symbolizes the deity's head piece, symbolizes an our head piece and uh, the chitta around the deity, we put it around us and uh, it's unfinished deity, Jagannath, where he doesn't have feet or hand or eyelids, so it symbolizes that he's watching everything but he's not saying anything. He is embracing you but he doesn't have a hand to stop you. So is he, all the powers have given to humankind this time and accordingly our karma we get the results. Okay, this is very auspicious photo for now because Navaratri is going on, Goddess Durga and riding on uh, the tiger like we ride on our lower nature, our um, uh, violentness, our uh, greediness, our uh, jealousiness, we ride upon it to bring the positive uh, emotions and she has weapons, this is Kali, see the Shiva lie down when the, the Durga went to the extreme uh, uh, intensity of killing demons and her energy went too high then the, the whole universe is going to melt, the whole universe was going to be destroyed, Shiva came out of her and lie down under her feet to say mother calm down and then when Kali saw husband on the, under her feet and she's stamping on his chest, her tongue came out like this, that's the position we worship and also her tongue expanded because the demons he was fighting with, wherever his blood will drop, the new demon will arrive, new demon will be created, so that's why she was, had the tongue out to hold the blood like that.
So no, no new demands will be created. That's how much he protects devotees. That not no new demands will keep coming to our heart and soul. He protects that you know, good qualities will be nurtured. This goddess is Saraswati, the goddess of art and knowledge and symbolic of purity, sits on the white lotus, lotus presents purity and the Bina presents the tune of our life, tune of our connectivity with the divine and tune of the energy in us and that is why Bina because if you tune it too hard that string is going to break, if you tune it too little low the tune is not going to come out, it has to be just right. So she holds the Bina and Saraswati is the goddess which is manifestation of wisdom in us. So how it goes is first is Durga which eliminates all the negativity and darkness and bad qualities, lower nature, um, Durga and Kali. Mm -hmm. And then Lakshmi comes, gives us the wealth of knowledge, wealth of creativity, wealth of inspiration, interest, wealth of discipline and to have a proceed in the path, wealth. And then Saraswati comes when that wealth manifests as a wisdom, as knowledge. So that's this goddesses are uh, worshipped. This pose is taken on that uh, Chausati Jogini, which I said it, uh, the goddess temple, the old goddess temple. This uh, uh, picture is taken there um, 10 years ago. And the silk sari is women in uh, Odisha and particular patterns uh, are women uh, like it has elephants, it has fish, it has the wheels of Konarak, like that patterns are women in these uh, saris and we make this costume out of those silk saris and it's uh, very auspicious and we wear it just to perform and it's, uh, we perform and we keep it because performance is still as a worship. Right. So these are worn for the performances only. So good choice of photos, we know. You have many, so many beautiful mm -hmm. things. Very good job. And thank you for sharing. And viewers, really, this girl is amazing. She loves dance. She's hide. about dance. And really, I bless her for bright, bright future. And um, she's amazing. I am very impressed. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jyoti. We have an opportunity uh, for our viewers out there. This is. October 3rd, 2014, in case you're wondering. Today and tomorrow, Jyoti's going to be giving workshops. We will have the link, but tonight we'll be at Page Dance Academy. Tomorrow we'll be at Crossroads at Hawaiian Bryan's. There will be a link for that information, even if you've never done dance before. And we're hoping that with this interview, you can see the amount of uh, information and knowledge, and knowledge and wisdom. It really takes a lifetime mm -hmm. to uh, to imbue that. However, every journey starts with a single step or a oh, single yes. jati or a single hasta. Yes. And, and I think that that's so important is a lot of times people might feel intimidated and they think, oh, I can't do this. I'm starting it too late in my life. But whatever you learn, your life is enriched and it's, it benefits from that new wisdom, those new perspectives, those new ideas, that joy. You know, you talked about uh, Lakshmi and wealth. And I think another way to describe wealth is abundance. And, yes. and dance is about abundance because it brings and attracts all of those beautiful energies into your life. Talking about uh, being beginners uh, who never danced, there is not such a thing that we never danced. Yes. The moment we existed, the heartbeat comes first. Exactly. It's God. a rhythm. Yes. And it's very interesting that when heartbeat goes out of sync, it's called iridimia. <laughs> You're not in rhythm. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so um, everybody dances. If you're not a dancer, you cannot appreciate the wave of ocean. You cannot appreciate the breeze, touch of breeze. You cannot appreciate the colors of flowers. You cannot appreciate another human being smiling at you. Or somebody is in a pain or crying. Yeah. Or somebody is yelling at you. you, you can't feel those things. As long you're feeling, as long you're alive, you are a dancer. Ah, you are Rasa. <laughs> and you know, we have run out of time, unfortunately, but I would love for our viewers to know 
the meaning and the significance of your name. It's something I asked you a few <laughs> days ago, and there's so much poetry and truth in your name. Would you please tell us again? My name is Jyoti. Jyoti means light, the illumination. And our school is Jyoti Kala Mandir. So the light in the arts of temple, Jyoti is light, and Kala is art, Mandir is temple. So we bring the light in the temple of arts. So you're all welcome to join us. And you are dancers. Everybody is dancers. Everybody is dancers. It's a matter of knowing it. Thank you so much for your time. Looking forward to your adventures this weekend. And hopefully, God willing, we'll have you back again in 2015. Thank you for your time, Jyoti. Thank you, Willow. Thank you.